My name is Suzanne Tripp, and I chair the Grandmothers Against Gun Violence Board of Directors. I'd like to welcome you to our first quarterly webinar for 2024. We have an excellent group of panelists joining us today for a discussion of safe storage of firearms. And our moderator, Margaret Helgring, will introduce them in a minute. But first, I'd like to mention a few things. Uh, you can put uh, questions for our panelists into Q&A, and we have someone behind the scenes who will tee up questions for Margie to ask. You can find resources concerning safe storage of firearms on our website at grandmothersagainstgunviolence.org. We're very proud that the Grandmothers Foundation funded a University of Washington capstone project in 2022 for a group of four women in an informatics class who chose safe storage of guns as their topic of research and whose graphic is used on our website and other social media. As an organization, Grandmothers has chosen to focus on safe storage in 2024. Our campaign, Grandmothers Care, Safe Storage Saves Lives, will include information delivered on our website, outreach to media, and through public programs such as the one we're presenting today. With over half of gun owners, owners leaving their firearms accessible and unsafely stored, and with firearm-related injuries now the leading cause of death, of children and teens, we feel this campaign is urgent. I'd like to thank our program committee for putting today's event together, especially committee co-chairs, Maggie Carr and Jane Scriven, and committee member, Jane Weiss. Finally, I'd like to thank you for your continued support and activism. As you know, the Washington State Legislature just concluded its 2024 session. And thanks to lobbying efforts by grandmothers and others, Several gun safety bills are headed to the governor for his signature. Your emails, phone calls, and Zoom and in-person meetings with legislators do make a difference. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Margie Heldring. Margie co-founded Grandmothers Against Gun Violence in 2013 after the Sandy Hook shooting and served as board chair for most of our organization's first decade. Her leadership made grandmothers an influential voice in the gun violence prevention movement and helped achieve the passage of several important gun safety laws in Washington state. Margie continues to be a visible and vocal advocate in Olympia, giving testimony for gun safety bills even in this most uh, recent legislative session. She currently serves on the board of the Grandmothers Against Gun Violence Foundation. Margie is a retired clinical psychologist in her career, she served as clinical faculty in the UW Department of Family Medicine, as healthcare legislative assistant to former U.S. Senators Bill Bradley and Paul Wellstone, as a senior policy advisor on Bill Bradley's presidential campaign, and as the founder and executive director of the national nonprofit America's Health Together. Margie, thank you for your inspiring leadership and for moderating today's panel. Now, over to you. Suzanne, thank you very much. That's a wonderful recap of grandmothers and a very kind introduction. And I add my welcome to everybody here today and an early thank you to our panelists who have agreed to give their time, their stories, and their expertise to help us explore this critical and promising issue of safe storage. I wanted to just put before us, as before I introduce our first panelist, why does safe storage matter so much? The other part of that question or the other side of that question is, what can happen if firearms and ammunition are not stored safely? Several tragedies, several things, all of which are preventable can happen. One is unintentional shootings, unintentional deaths and injuries. Another is suicide, access to a poorly or insecurely stored firearm and ammunition may interact with an impulse to take one's life. Another, a third is domestic violence or interpersonal partner violence when in the heat of the moment, the anger of the moment, 
an accessible and easily accessible firearm can be the final step to a tragedy, to a death. Another negative, terrible consequence of insecurely stored firearms is theft. When firearms are stolen out of the home and the car and used for tragic purposes. Actually, 76% of firearms used in school shootings come from the home and were accessed because of improperly stored firearms. All of these tragedies are preventable with properly secured firearms and ammunition. So I applaud the Grandmothers Program Committee, the campaign of 2024 that says grandmothers care and all of our work to try to save lives. But let me begin by welcoming our panelists again and introducing our first panelists. We are very fortunate to have with us today, Giovanna Young McDowell. She is a woman of faith, an army wife and a Navy mom. Family is important to her. After her 14 year old son's life was taken tragically in 2016 by another teen playing with an unsecured firearm, Giovanna was determined not to let her grief define her, but to elevate her to be a motivator for others. She started advocating and mentoring youth. She is a fierce gun violence prevention advocate, committed to saving lives by sharing her story of living beyond tragedy. She is also an activist on issues of oppression, racial disparities, and gender equity. Her survivor story has been featured in Essence, Vogue, and Humanity, and People's Magazine. Giovanna, we are grateful and welcome. And please, it's for you now. Thank you, Margie. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank Grandmothers Against Gun Violence for inviting me here today. Grandmothers Care, Safe Stores Saves Lives for a much needed conversation. Again, my name is Giovanna McDowell and I'm a volunteer with the Moms Demand Action here in Georgia and a senior fellow with the Everytown Survivor Network. There are titles that we gain from life natural experiences um, like that of being a spouse, a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, and the list is endless. But there is a title that is not natural and not normal, and that is a survivor of gun violence. It is one that I wouldn't wish upon anyone that's listening. As a gun violence survivor, sharing our story is not easy, but it's necessary to start this conversation of secure storage to save lives. I think about beyond statistics and numbers, there are families that will never see their loved ones again in the physical. There are communities, there are neighborhoods and schools that are impacted every day with gun violence. And on my and with my story, on March the 7th, 2016, we celebrated my son Juwan's 14th birthday. I remember watching him blow out his candles on his chocolate chip blunt cake, his favorite color, his favorite flavor. And I remember him making several wishes. Um, Juwan was truly something to celebrate. He was such a caring and sweet, and well-mannered young man, something I like to take credit for. I often call him Bud because he was my rosebud. A rosebud signifies beauty and purity. On April the 7th, 2016, one month after he celebrated his birthday, my smart and kind, generous and wonderful Bud, Juwan, was shot and killed by another team playing with an unsecured firearm while visiting family in Savannah, Georgia for spring break. I never imagined that when I spoke on the phone with Jawan just hours before, that it would be the last time I would hear my baby's voice. Like the end of so many other phone calls, I told him I loved him and to be safe. I'm sure many of us listening in have had phone calls just like that with family and friends. He told me, I love you, mommy words that are forever imprinted in my heart. Hours later, I got the phone call that no parent should ever receive and it changed my life forever. Unfortunately, this isn't all that uncommon in the United States. 
Over 4.6 million children in this country currently live in a home with an unsecured gun. And research shows that these tragedies are more likely to occur during holidays, when kids are home from school, are visiting family and friends. Had that firearm been securely stored that spring break, my son would still be alive to celebrate this past March the 7th, which would should have been his 22nd birthday. The harsh reality is he will forever be 14. As adults, we're responsible for keeping our children safe, which is why I'm speaking to you all today as a Be Smart advocate, as a parent, and as a gun violence survivor. I honor Jawan by using my voice to talk to parents, physicians, neighbors, communities, caregivers, and lawmakers alike about secure storage of firearms. Secure storage is an easy and simple way to not just keep our homes safe, but our schools and communities safe from the many forms of gun violence like homicide, suicide, and mass shootings. The numbers of our youth dying by firearm suicide reflects the ugliest side of this crisis as well. These instances of violence, death, and injury are completely preventable. That's why I, alongside other survivors of gun violence, Moms Demand Action volunteers, you all listening today, and public health experts work so hard to get the word out about secure firearm storage and advocate for the Be Smart program. Join me in honoring Jawan and the millions of sons and daughters, sisters, brothers, husbands, and wives who have been lost to senseless gun violence. We as advocates will continue to share that message, which is why I started advocating with gun violence survivors and finding my voice amidst this pain with the Everytown Survivor Network. I often say that Jawan will save lives as I say his name in rooms and spaces that he didn't have an opportunity to enter. And I would like to turn it back over to you, Ms. Marguerite, and thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. Thank you very much for being here with us today to share your story. And the fact that you are sharing it with so many people around the country and so many different kinds of audiences is powerful and generous. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to remind people that you can put any questions or comments in the Q&A, and we will get to the Q&A after each of our panelists has spoken. It is now my pleasure to introduce former Washington State Legislative Representative Ruth Kage. Ruth was elected to our Washington State Legislature in 1998 to represent the 36th, 32nd Legislative District. She was a pioneer in educating the legislature and the public about the critical importance of early childhood development. Ruth chaired the House Early Learning and Human Services Committee and sponsored the Early Start Act. She was the primary architect of the new State Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Ruth retired in 2019 after 20 years of service. Her advocacy impacted and improved early learning, child welfare, and juvenile justice administrations. Today, she chairs the board of the Children's Campaign Fund, which she helped start 35 years ago, is a lifelong member of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence, and spends time having fun with her children and grandchildren. Ruth was the spark for the work on safe storage in Washington State. And I'm excited to turn it over to you, Ruth, to tell us your story. Thank you, Margie, very much for that very generous introduction. And it's really um, my pleasure to be here today. Um, it was 10 years ago that the issue of safe gun storage uh, really uh, became a focus in the Washington State House and the it was really, my interest came from seeing too many children and youth killed when they accessed a, a gun in their home and shot themselves or a friend. And it was just heartbreaking, um, as we've heard today, uh, the, the just totally preventable loss of a child. 
So I um, started working on a safe gun storage bill because we had data about Florida, California, 20 other states, 28 other states that had passed dangerous access prevention bills. And on average, those states were seeing a 23% reduction in unintentional firearm deaths among youth under 15. So that was pretty compelling. And I worked with the Alliance for Gun Responsibility to develop a bill and introduced it. Um, it was House Bill 1676. And the title was Encouraging the Safe Storage of Firearms. And it was very focused on children. Person, a person is guilty of reckless, reckless endangerment for leaving or storing a loaded firearm in a location where a child is likely to and does gain access to a firearm. So it, um, it was a very broad bill and uh, it did have a hearing in the house and the NRA was there in force uh, talking about it being overly broad and <clears throat> that if we required parents to lock up guns, then we should require them to lock up aspirin and laundry soap and grano. Uh, it, was, it was a very, very frustrating hearing. Um, but at the end of the day, we did not have the votes to get it out of committee, so the bill died. Two years later, after working more with the Alliance and with grandmothers, um, I sponsored a second bill, House Bill 1747, which was an act relating to the protection of children through the responsible storage of firearms. And in this case, um, if a child accessed a firearm and caused personal injury or death, the gun owner would be guilty of child endangerment. Um, but if the, the gun was stolen and it was reported stolen, then they would not. Uh, it was more narrowly, carefully drawn, but the NRA appeared again in force and, uh, and there were not the votes in the committee to get it out. So third time's a charm. In 2017, I sponsored H. Bill 1122. I really decided that um, the issue of gun storage was much broader than just children. And I also um, was became very aware that suicide is a much greater threat to children accessing a gun in a moment of despair and, uh, and shooting themselves. And so youth suicide became a, a real important driver to me because more than 75% of all youth suicide attempts are committed with a gun in the home. So uh, this bill in, in 2017 was an act relating to protecting public safety through responsible storage. Thank you so much. We got a hearing and this time, instead of coming into a hearing room full of camouflage, I came into a hearing room filled with orange. And uh, it, it really uh, was a powerful hearing. Uh, we had put together panels of parents and family members who had lost children through gun violence, uh, parents who had lost, lost children through suicide, and uh, public health experts and doctors. It was, it was an extremely effective hearing. And as a result, uh, the, the bill did get reported out of committee and went to the Rules Committee. Unfortunately, the Speaker of the House at the time um, would not allow it out of the Rules Committee and would not allow it to come to the floor of the House. So the bill died. And it was at that point that the Alliance for Gun Responsibility and grandmothers and many others started working on the initiative in 1639. On all three of the bills that I sponsored, uh, the second name on the bill was Lori Jenkins, who is now Speaker of the House. And it's a real demonstration of the importance of leadership. Since uh, Lori Jenkins became Speaker, the House has been truly a leader in passing uh, all kinds of resp responsible gun ownership bills and is becoming a leader in the nation. The initiative, 1639, um, 
was very similar to the bills I introduced. It doesn't mandate that fire, firearms owners lock up their guns, but if a, a prohibited person, which means a child or a felon or someone convicted of domestic violence, accesses a firearm because it is not safely stored and then causes harm or displays it pu publicly in a threatening way or commits a crime with it, the owner can be held responsible. And that accountability is just so important. It was so devastating to see so many children die and no one could be held accountable, even when the adults were egregiously uh, negligent. So the bill passed uh, with over 60% uh, of the vote, which really shows how far out ahead of the legislature uh, the public was. And so we have a very strong uh, safe gun storage bill in this uh, in this state. And I'm just very sorry the legislature didn't pass it. The public had to pass it. Turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I can, and we can understand your regret that the legislature didn't pass it, but we also want to express our respect and appreciation that you stayed with it, that you went time and time again with this issue and with potential legislation, with legislation, potential new laws and policies to promote safe storage. There's no doubt in our mind that your early work laid the foundation for what has grown in this state and around the country. And just to add a note about the Grandmothers Against Gun Violence Foundation, we testified before the Seattle City Council in 2019 when they were considering an ordinance requiring safe storage and they did pass it. And I feel quite strongly that your work and the work of Lori and others uh, had educated people to the point where they understood the necessity for this and the value for this. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm delighted to introduce our third panelist. And I um, want to say that Juliet, who I'll give her a description in a moment, comes from moms. And uh, we love working with moms. Grandmothers and moms seems like a very you know, natural affinity. So Juliet, we're thrilled you are here. She has been a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America since 2017. As I think most of us know, Moms is a grassroots movement of Americans fighting for public safety measures that can protect people from gun violence. Among her many volunteer roles, locally, she remains pass passionate about the Be Smart for Kids program that we're going to hear about. This program focuses on education about child gun deaths, the importance of conversation, gun storage, and community awareness. Juliet is a Shoreline resident and the mother of two young boys. And Juliet, we welcome you and turn the floor to you. Thank you, Margie. And thank you to grandmothers for having me for this great opportunity amongst this panel of fierce change makers. I, I feel proud to be present. Um, I am going to share my screen for some visuals. It's kind of how I roll. So a little bit of a change of pace for all of us. Um, let's see, here we go. One, all right, here we are. So again, thanks again. As mentioned in Margie's in, in opening, I am the mother of two boys and I live in Shoreline, Washington currently. And I initially got involved with gun violence prevention movement and specifically with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America because like many of you folks on the call, I had had enough. I was basically fed up with being fed a lie that this public health crisis was somehow a natural part of our American story. And that my sons would necessarily have to grow up with this kind of consequence of our American experience being forced on them. Parenting is hard as it is, but the presence of gun violence just seemed like it didn't need to be part of our story or anyone's story. I couldn't get my kids to sleep at night if I paid someone, but I could surely make sure they were safe beyond my grasp 
and as best as I could for as long as I could. So I've been involved with um, gun, line, gun violence prevention, as we mentioned now for going on seven years. So this image is a little old. My boys are now 11 and 13. And I've been, been involved in many pieces of the work, but I was immediately and have been consistently drawn to this particular program, the Be Smart program, for a real core set of reasons. And the first is that it feels very personal. So it was about keeping, again, my kids safe, but also the kids of the families that I have grown to know and love near me. It was local. So it was an action that I can take within my immediate community. It was a conversation about culture change. So I should know that I'm a sociologist by training. So I was, I, I am interested in moving the needle at that level. And also it was an opportunity that was more approachable for folks who maybe felt like those, the, the, the intimidating part of the legislative process so that wasn't something they could get involved with. And finally, it was actionable. I could see the impacts through every conversation I had around Be Smart, through the texts that I was sharing with individuals, the aha moments that I would see when I would give these presentations. Um, and I still get that every day. So what is Be Smart? Be Smart is a program that is developed by Every Town for Gun Safety Support Fund to bring together adults concerned about kids, guns, and safety. It's pretty simple. Um, but the concern is very real and the data illustrates this grim reality for our kids and our communities. Kids are living with guns. The research shows that 13 million households have children that contain, with children contain at least one gun. And of those, 4.6 million American children live in homes with guns that are not stored responsibly. And when we talk about responsible and safe storage, we are talking about the weapon being locked and unloaded and stored separately from ammunition. And the majority of children in gun-owning households actually know where the gun is stored. 41% of adolescents in gun-owning households reported having easy access to guns in their homes. As mentioned before, guns are the number one killer of children in America. Of those deaths every year, 350 children living in America under the age of 18 gain access to irresponsibly stored firearms and unintentionally, unintentionally shoot themselves or someone else, like a sibling, parent, friend, or another individual. And it's not just at home, as we know. Kids are bringing guns that they have easy access to to school. In up to 80% of incidents of gunfire on school grounds, underage shooters obtain their guns from their own home or the house of a relative or friend. So these statistics are alarming, very hard to swallow, and what we all know, they are entirely preventable realities. So it is the goal of the Be Smart program to help inspire adults who care about the health and safety of our children and our communities to talk about the simple steps that everyone, and that is gun owners and non-gun owners alike, can take to prevent these tragedies. The campaign itself focuses on education and awareness about child gun deaths, the importance of conversation, responsible gun storage and community awareness with the core message being that child safety is an adult responsibility. The program message is delivered through a brief 20 minute presentation for any interested adult audience. And I underline adult, this is not a program about educating how our kids should handle or not handle weapons. Um, the content of the presentation is not political in nature. It does not advocate for laws or policies to address gun safety. What it does do is go over methods for properly storing firearms and provides examples of ways to bring up and talk about gun safety and responsible gun storage with your children's friends, caregivers, as a part of overall kid safety. So the program is delivered in an easy to remember acronym, SMART, um, which emphasizes five simple steps to help prevent shootings by children. So the S stands for secure guns in your home and vehicles. And that means locking them up using gun locks or safes with the ammunition, ammunition stored separately, not just on a high shelf. Kids will find it. 
One study found that households that locked both firearms and ammunition were associated with an 85% lower risk of unintentional firearm injuries among children and teens compared to those that locked neither. Another study estimated that if households, if half of the households with children that had at least one unlocked gun switched to locking all of their guns, one third of youth suicides and unintentional deaths could be prevented, saving an estimated 251 lives in a single year. The M stands for model responsible behavior around guns, which means never leaving an unsecured gun where children can access it and don't clean a gun in the presence of a child. A is to ask about the presence of unsecured guns in other homes and places you visit. It is totally okay to ask someone who, if, if they own one to lock it up and the, conversely to suggest an alternate location to gather together if they choose not to. Even better, I often add to this that we can destigmatize this conversation further by telling others about our own storage status. So when, whenever, you, whenever new friends come to your home, whether you have babysitters or house sitters while you're away, asking and telling, and I would argue regularly as folks go on ownership status change, changes, um, is really what helps move this conversation out of the dark. The R stands for to rec recognize the risks of suicide. More than 85% of suicide attempts are successful when performed with a firearm. Nearly 700 children, 17 and under, die by suicide with a gun annually. Guns are effective, lethal tools. Removing easy access, no doubt, can save more lives. And the last letter, as we come full circle, is T, to tell your peers to be smart. And that's really about making sure we share the message, and the program does that quite a bit. I did want to take a moment to show folks what secure storage looks like, um, in, in addition to locked, separate from ammunition, and unloaded. Um, this slide illustrates that there are many affordable options, as what does the next, for firearm storage that provide owners with quick access to their guns while preventing access by children and people at increased risk of harming themselves or other. Further, it's possible, and this was mentioned earlier, that unsecured guns may actually increase the likelihood of crime and violence through an increased risk of gun theft. Each year, an estimated 200,000 to 500,000 guns are stolen and many are funneled into the underground market where once legally owned firearms can be transferred to people with dangerous histories. So again, remember, hiding a gun is not securing a gun, and that includes both in your homes and in your vehicles. And on the right side of this slide, you'll see what a console or vehicle gun safe can look like. More information about safe storage devices can be found on the Be Smart website, which is listed on the Grandmothers at website, and I will provide again at the end. And many of these devices can be bought both through local firearm dealers and even in some cases your local hardware store. Um, Moms Demand Action and Be Smart programs often are able to give away free cable locks when we do our tabling events, and so these are great resources for folks. So what can you do? And this is the best part about Be Smart. Um, everyone on this call cares about the safety of our families and communities, and therefore you can take a part in this. And part of that is talking to your friends about the importance with gun, about gun storage. And it goes without saying, practicing safe storage yourself. So I first encourage you to visit the Be Smart website to find out more about the program. And there are tons of resources available on there. Um, including images to share out publicly through social media or other outlets. Um, the second piece is that just that, spreading the word about Be Smart through your own social media platforms or even by word of mouth. It's about this powerful and easy to remember message. Um, the next level of engagement may include hosting a presentation. Um, as I mentioned, we do this presentation for any adult audience, and I like to joke that I'll do it for your knitting group and your book club, but really any small, any group, large or small of adult audience that is interested, it's we're willing to share that with them. Um, you may want to become a presenter yourself, and it's really easy, and the online training occurs every two months about online, and there happens to be one tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you visit the Be Smart website, that's a way to grab a hold of that. 
And then there are other ways to volunteer with Be Smart that are not giving the presentation. Um, it is a all hands on deck kind of effort. And so I encourage it. Um, and I will share that on my next slide, how to connect. And then for extra credit um, for folks, I'd like to draw your attention to recent legislation in Washington state that required school districts specifically and public other public education entities to make information about safe storage available on their public facing websites. And that includes storage, secure storage of firearms and ammunition. And so maybe you want to go visit your local school district website and see if they have it on there. And if it doesn't, maybe it's time to write an email. So with that, I just share this last bit. If you want, you can visit the Be Smart website and the resources is the bottom left. Um, you can text the word SMART to 64433 to get involved locally in the, uh, with the Be Smart program. And then this QR code is an unofficial um, form if you're in the Puget Sound area, or I dare you, you can fill it in otherwise, but this takes you to, if you know of an audience already that you'd like to hear have hear this message. Um, it, it's just a way for us to collect information and we can get that to you. And with that, I will stop my screen share. I can leave this, we'll share these resources in the chat as well. And I hand the mic back to you, Marty. Yes, Juliet, thank you very much. Your commitment to this and your clarity about these action steps that we can take individually or as groups neighborhoods as a state comes through so clearly. So that is that is really wonderful work. Listening to you three panelists, it stands out that you each represent an important part of a change process when it comes to safe storage or any other kind of gun violence prevention change. And, and uh, Giovanna told us the human experience, the personal story of this. Representative Keggy introduced us to the role of the legislature in, in this and new laws that can come and promote. And Juliet, your work, uh, Be Smart, and uh, a lot of what you're advising and offering strikes me as the basis for cultural change. And these three together, that what, what really happens? What is this experience like? What can a state legislature or hopefully someday the U.S. Congress do? But what can we do to make cultural change, to create new norms around gun ownership and gun safety is, is really important. So thank you. Giovanni, I'd like to uh, pose a question to you to begin with because it's just beyond impressive how you have acknowledged your experience but then stepped into the world of advocacy so that other people do not have to go through what you and your family are going through. What are some of the tools for advocacy that you have found most effective? What helps people take action and support change? I think um, that starts with, um, there is a, what I consider like a culture shift or a culture change. Um, we rather it being prevented where we are preventing things from happening instead of being reactive to a lot of things. Um, and so that starts with getting involved. Um, like Juliet was speaking of um, the Be Smart program. There are resources out there that we can utilize um, as preventative measures um, to secure, to make sure that we're doing our due diligence as adults to save our children lives. Um, and if it's something that we can do then why not do it? If it's something that we know will save lives, then it just seems like it would be the norm to just go ahead and get, jump into action to be able to. Um, with the epidemic increasing every single day, you turn on the news, you hear of gun violence every single day. Um, and I think that although we are seeing some shift and some changes, the needle is kind of tipping in the right direction. We just have to keep at it. You know, even one small bill being passed, no matter how small it is, it is an effective change that can gradually um, grow. Uh, we know that there's not gonna be one actual thing that's gonna prevent all gun violence. It's gonna take multiple legislations that has to be presented. And But taking that course of action of starting where we can prevent it, Simple sources, just be smart. Make sure you secure 
your gun at all times. Make sure that gun is inaccessible to children and ask about the presence of guns before you allow your child to go visit. Um, holidays are coming up. Kids are about to be out of school um, here shortly. Different things, spring break. You know, we don't think about having those conversations, but it's a definitely a necessary conversation that be that should be had every single day um, in casual conversations. I know a lot of people may say it's very uncomfortable. And my response to them is I would rather you have an uncomfortable conversation than an uncomfortable experience. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm experiencing every single day. Mm -hmm. yes, ma Thank you very much. Your comment about staying with it and that moving the needle, even if, if it seems a little bit at a time, invites me to just comment for all of us. Uh, I hope you are familiar with, and if you are not, let me help you become familiar with two new executive orders from the Biden administration just recently, both of which address safe storage, which is a priority for the new White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention again, reflecting the growth of the safe storage movement from the state to the national level. One executive order works with the Department of Justice for them to develop educational tools for families on how to store your guns safely. Mechanisms, strategies, different things to do. The other executive order works with the Department of Education. And Juliet, you were mentioning schools to develop a communication template uh, to send home to families. All the high school principals in the country are going to get this. I, you're nodding, you're familiar with it. Um, here's how to talk, here's how you can talk to your families about safe storage and please do. So we have a question from the audience here I'd like to ask. Uh, this question touches on something that Giovanna touched on, but. Do you see the culture changing? What do you think needs to happen next? And I would invite any one of you three wonderful panelists to speak to that. Um, I can jump in. Good. Um, I, I think it is, and I think kind of similar, I think Giovanni touched on this as did as Ruth, and in all of it, it's it, and this is what Shannon Watts often says, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? So it's, we're taking, it. sometimes it feels very sluggish, but I absolutely see change. I think for good or ill, the pandemic has helped us in the sense that it allows us to have really co public conversations about public health. And this is a public health problem, right? So getting people to recognize that safety and is, is it should be a natural part of how we take care of our communities. I think that that I think that the it is people are we are making change. Absolutely. Good. Thank well, you. And I'd like to second that. Certainly, um, the legislature in the last four years, the culture has changed dramatically. And it's not just the leadership. It's the people who've been elected to the legislature. And I know that um, Grandmothers Against Gun Violence and Moms Demand Action and the Alliance for Gun Responsibility uh, all are engaged in asking candidates about their positions on uh, a number of, of uh, responsible gun ownership bills. And so the, the people in the legislature are much more supportive of responsible gun legislation. And, um, and I think that is something that all of us have to ask candidates what mm. their positions are mm -hmm. on, uh, on the, the gun issues that are going to be before them in the legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. We have another question that I, I think is a very um, central question. Many gun owners perceive that safe storage of guns prevents their quick access to confront a threat to their safety. How do we address this myth? Anyone like to jump in? Julie. I have an I have an anecdote, which okay. is that I know, for instance, that so part of the Be Smart program is we do a lot of tabling. So we will 
people at public health fairs or farmers markets or whatever. And I know that in one state, I had heard a great instance where somebody they had actually acquired a, a safe and they load it with Smarties, the unofficial candy of Be Smart. But and they would have folks test it out about how fast they could basically open the safe. And and it really, I mean, it's it seemed to be pretty remarkable. I have I don't know if there's any specific research about how long it takes, but um, giving people the actual tangible evidence right there to say, can you get it in a, in two seconds, five seconds when you need it? It was, it seemed like a really great way to get the message across. Thank you. Giovanna or Ruth, do you have any comments on that? What can be a challenging question? Well, um, in the last hearing, uh, for the, for the last bill I introduced, we had someone from public health and we had a press conference before the hearing and he opened the safe, you know, and it, it took him like three seconds. And I think that with the biometric uh, safes, it's, it's just, it's just almost instantaneous. So I, I think you're right, Juliet, having, having a safe to demonstrate how quickly you can access a gun is um, very helpful. Yeah. Giovanna, do you have any comments on that or? No, I would just agree with everyone um, that there have been um, things that they've done with the biometric safe to show you that you can get in, get into that safe within a matter of seconds. Um, and just as quick as you can get into that safe, just as quick as a child can get access to that gun also, just always keep that in mind that you rather the safety part of it um, than to have that unsecured firearm um, accessible to that child. Thank you. Yes. I, I have paid a lot of attention as grandmothers has and all of us have to this question over the years. And we've seen a rise in women purchasing guns. Uh, feeling vulnerable in their home and or persuaded that they're vulnerable, being persuaded that they're vulnerable in their home. And I, I have come to really believe and want to just ask you panelists what you think of this, that the fear is legitimate. The fear is real, that people feel um, threats and, and danger. There are many people who have had experiences of threats and danger, but somehow the uh, solution has a, a, arisen to buy a gun as the way of handling that. And perhaps there are other things that can be done. So that is one question. The second thing I would like to put out to you three panelists is what do you think is the role of gun owners in promoting safe storage? What could it be? What should it be? So it's really two parts. How do we address the real vulnerability that many homeowners have, many parents have, many people living alone have, many people with prior histories of threats and danger have, and what is the role of gun owners? I think um, to answer that question, I think fear is real, um, as you stated. Um, but the second part to that is, although that fear is real, safety is more important making sure that we do our due diligence as adults to if we are going to be gun owners because we're all more alike than we are different especially if safety is our number one priority and keeping our children safe is making sure that that gun is securely stored uh, with the ammunition separate locked on the lock and key or a biometric safe uh, making sure that we have that conversation let t and be smart is to tell your peers to be smart having that necessary conversation about gun safety. A lot of gun owners believe in safety as well. Um, they do training. If they're really gun enthusiasts, majority of the time, they are willing to do gun safety and they believe in secure storage as well. So just having that necessary conversation, even if that fear is there, if you if you know that that fear is there, you know that there are the possibility that in a matter of just fear, things can change just that quick. That's why that model and responsible behavior is also a part of be smart, making sure, you know, in that instance of fear, if you fire that gun, knowing that that bullet goes up, it's got to come down somewhere. So just making sure you do your due diligence as well and taking as much gun safety courses as you can as a gun owner. Thank you. Excellent. 
And I, I would add just to the first piece, I th think that there are, this is where the other pieces of a systemic response to gun violence prevention really play in. The notion that we should have in place, and we do in Washington state, instances where individuals who should know, domestic violent offenders should no longer have access to a weapon and they should be, you know, so there are laws in place that are trying to make sure that victims of violence are not, they're not being repeated under the same, the same situation. Um, and then to the question about gun owners, um, I think the gun owner voice is absolutely part of the advocacy and um, I regularly will be wearing our Moms Demand Action red shirts for our advocacy day in Olympia, and we'll have individuals there for other purposes come up to us and say, I'm a gun owner, and this has gotten out of hand, and I appreciate the work you're doing. And so the more we can responsible, the majority of gun owners are responsible gun owners. I want to believe that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that is true. And so no, bringing that voice to the table and saying, these are individuals who want to make sure our kids are safe too. And the nice thing about Be Smart is, again, it takes away this conversation. It takes away the piece about whether I feel it's okay for you to have a weapon. It's just making sure that you lock it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julie. I agree that gun owners are a very powerful voice. And uh, I heard from many gun owners as I sponsored these bills about how much they supported it because they felt safe gun storage was so important. Um, Representative Tina Orwall uh, worked with the Second Amendment Foundation on an effort to educate their members who are all gun owners about the importance of safe storage. So um, I, you know, who knows, maybe the NRA may come around someday and realize that safe gun storage is, is uh, really something that they should uh, promote. But I, I think gun owners are a very powerful voice. Yeah. And I personally keep bear spray in my bedside table <laughs> and I feel a lot safer than having a gun. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. There is an organization that some of you may wish to go to their website and learn about called 97%. And it is an organization comprised uh, largely of gun owners working with non-gun owners around safe storage and other gun violence prevention initiatives. So again, one of the, the movements we've seen over the past decade, safe storage, but also this collaboration between responsible gun owners concerned about safety and those of us working on the gun violence prevention movement. I, I think that's a very hopeful future direction and, and growing direction. Another question has come in about, do you know what gun shop owners are required to do to inform buyers about safe storage? Anybody wanna take? They are required yes. to um, to advise buyers of the requirement that they must store their guns safely. And they're required to post something um, at the store that says the same thing. And I believe uh, they're required to offer uh, right. a gun lock or safe gun store, safe gun safe right. when they sell the gun. Right. I believe that is true, Ruth. I think that's accurate, yes. Let me ask you panelists if you have questions for each other based on what your particular area of experience and expertise is. Is there anything that's come up that you'd like to ask one another? Juliet, I'm wondering where you're seeing the biggest take up of your offer to provide education to groups? Is it PTAs or, uh, you know? I um, I kind of sit on a mission to try to give give the presentation to PTAs um, and, uh, and I've tried to help figure out a structure by which other folks could do that in their local PTAs because the thing about PTAs is they change every year. So, or every two years. So, and the kids kind of move through. So it's kind of a wrapped audience. I would like to get into um, areas. I would like to get into, maybe it's a, not assisted living, but maybe senior centers um, because there are, you know, there are kids going to 
extended families homes all the time visiting and like are we making sure that this conversation is happening less about the play dates and i mean that is very important that's the core of be smart and in, in thinking about younger kids but having having some of these conversations kind of along the spectrum of of, of potential gun owners um but yeah i mean right now it's a lot it's focused it's a parents really you know parents of school age kids who in whatever audiences they want that to be brought to i've done it for preschool boards um but again, we will give it, I, I mean, it's up to the presenter, but I will meet you, I have like a Dr. Seuss, I'll meet you in a bar, I'll meet you in a parking lot. I mean, I will give this presentation to anybody who will hear it, so. Um, uh, I was going to mention Child Care Centers uh, okay. as a, a place where, you know, there are a lot of parents and they really need to hear this message. Well, and I wanted to, it wasn't so much a question as like a, I wanted to sing your praises because I had a very powerful, our first, one of my first lobby days is days in Olympia. We met with you. I'm also in the 32nd. So we met with you in the, in the um, rotunda. And that was when you, you gave us hope, if you will, saying that you had in, seen, you know, seen the needle moving in Washington state legislature in the right direction. And so for those of us who were kind of new to the game and being frustrated by, you know, bills dying in committee, you were really a, a strong voice for that. And then I also got to um, give testimony for the bill that you had introduced around keeping firearms out of early childcare centers, because who knew that was a thing that you could do? <laughs> so not so much a question, but just a thank you, fangirl moment. That's lovely. That's lovely, Juliet. Yes, to see you two um, meet up on, on the path here with this work. A couple things. Uh, Jane Weiss has just reminded us to, and I want to pass along her reminder, that the National PTA and Every Town for Gun Safety has just announced that they are in partnership with Be Smart as of last Friday. So that's really terrific. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, and PTA continues to make gun violence prevention a legislative priority in their own advocacy work. It continues to be one of the top five for both Washington state and national. So natural partners, absolutely. Good. Yeah, very exciting, very exciting. I, I want to say, Julia, thank you for mentioning senior centers and senior assisted living facilities. I know that the grandmother's care safe storage campaign that Grandmothers is involved in right now is taking a close look at taking this work to senior residences. And maybe there can be some collaboration here because not only are the older people uh, in the senior residences deeply concerned and looking for ways to use their voices and be of help, they have contact with their children, their grandchildren, and actually, we have many grandparents who are raising their children. And so to remember the uh, early childhood people, as well as the, what should we call us, later in life people, is, is really reflecting the multi-generational nature of this movement and the need for all generations to have this information. So thank you very much yeah, for that. We've been talking a little... Go ahead. Margie, I just want to comment that it just is so shocking to me that 50% of gun owners do not safely store their arms. Yeah. And, you know, we have so much more work to do. It, it just, um, I just really have a hard time believing that. And I know it's true. Yeah. And yeah. I would add that combating it with not the response. So the NRA's response was a program called Eddie the Eagle, which is about teaching kids how to handle firearms, which is not like big thumbs down, not the way. I mean, there's all this research that says if kids after a full training went and saw a weapon in a park, they'd probably pick it up, you know? And yeah. so it is absolutely an adult responsibility. That's a great message, Juliet, to keep making. We are the adults in this. It is our responsibility. Uh, we are coming near the end. I want to share uh, uh, one thing just briefly and then anybody who would like to wrap up. But we've been talking about our state-based work and bringing up the national work. I, I think all of you are probably aware of Ethan's Law, which is a piece of national legislation uh, requiring safe storage. And Giovanni, I know you and I talked about 
Kristen Song and our connection with her and whose son was killed in the very painful similar circumstances as yours going to a friend's house. The boys were playing with the unstored loaded firearms and he died. Ethan's Law has been um, in the works now for a couple years and slowly but surely you know more people are co-sponsoring hearings take place so uh, there's there's a parallel effort on the national level that's very important and with the recent white house promotion of safe storage we'll see we'll see what the congress looks like in 2025 but i'm hopeful that that will be a, a new law nationally before uh too long so we have be aware of that. And let me go back to you three outstanding panelists to thank you and, and ask if anybody has any closing comments they'd like to make as we finish. I to say change thank is you. incremental and just keep at it. Yeah. Persistence, yes. Giovanna, you were saying? Yes, I was just going to piggyback off of what she was saying. Yes, um, thank you all for the opportunity to be here to share Juwan's story, my story. Um, and also remember, we can't be casual about this conversation. We have to be intentional. We have to make sure we're not just having a conversation, but we're doing the action. If you're a gun owner, secure your gun. If you're not and your child is going to visit, make sure you ask and remember to always be smart. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I think that is a lovely way to finish. Giovanna, to you for sharing your story and your advocacy. Ruth, for your persistence, staying with it. Juliet, for your educational work, your culture change inspiration. Thank you all very, very much. And be in touch with grandmothers. We love to partner. We love to collaborate. And Keep up the great work. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.